Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. As usual, we're giving a second for all of you to hop into the uh, Zoom webinar. We have a really great topic today and uh, looking forward to hearing it. We wanna get as much time for our presenters today, so we're gonna go into our updates. We have just one main update today from Dr. Collins. So, uh, Will, I'll, I'll start with you real quick. Uh, thanks for joining us as well. Okay, um, I can't share. Uh... Oh, <laughs> uh, Kari, could you stop sharing? The, oh, sorry, the sure, sorry, Will. No worries. <laughs> okay. And Dr. Collins is going to do a brief update on the uh, daily inpatient okay. COVID center. Yeah. So I'm just going to give a very quick update on our inpatient numbers for COVID-19. Uh, oh, is it moving? There we go. Um, so as a quick context, these are uh, charts from both the New York Times and the COVID tracking project, basically showing kind of the state of things here in the US. So the red uh, graph is uh, new reported cases by day, the blue is hospitalizations, and the gray is deaths. And as you can see, uh, for about the last month now, we've had rises in case numbers and now rises in hospitalizations uh, for the country. Um, deaths have not risen, although still, um, you know, pretty significant daily numbers. Um, and it is possible that that may be just lagging behind some of these other trends. So certainly something to be aware of as we move into the winter. Um, for the Bay Area, though, we still have a, a pretty good positive downward trend, excuse me, since our peak uh, in July and August. Um, this is showing confirmed and suspected uh, COVID patients hospitalized in the ICU for our seven Bay Area counties. And, and then when we look at uh, Stanford again, our, our trends are similar to the Bay Area, um, showing here positive cases, as well as hospitalizations at Stanford and Stanford Valley Care. Um, so as you can see, generally speaking, the trends um, have continued to come down from our peak, um, but certainly we haven't quite reached our winter here uh, as of yet. Um, for uh, more uh, specific numbers, uh, this morning we had four PUI in the hospital, nine confirmed positive COVID, and <clears throat> excuse me, three uh, in the ICU. Um, for total numbers from March uh, through October 10th, we had now 488 at Stanford. We're still at a little over 21% needing ICU care, and our deaths remain at 31. Uh, we have uh, slightly more female than male, and our age range, as before, uh, fairly, fairly wide across the different adult ages. Uh, so um, thank you uh, to everyone who helps with these numbers, and let's get to the great presentation today. Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Collins. I appreciate it. Um, we're going to get right into uh, our presenter today. Before that, I do want to briefly mention that next week we have the Lambda trial with Dr. Prasanna Jagannathan, and he's going to be talking about the results of that trial, uh, as well as the week after that, we have immunomodulators treatment of COVID-19 with Drs. Uh, Ritagi, Ahuja, and Von Krenz. So we're looking forward to those next two uh, upcoming grand rounds. But today we have a, a really all-star group of presenters and this is officially our first non, technically non-COVID uh, themed Grand Rounds. We first started having these Grand Rounds on Zoom uh, back in early March. So thanks so much for our presenters today. Uh, we're starting off with Dr. Kari Nadeau. Uh, Dr. Nadeau is the Natasi Foundation Endowed Professor of Medicine and Pediatrics, and she's also the director of the Sean Parker Center of Allergy and Asthma Research at Stanford University. She's a section B for Chief for uh, Allergy and uh, uh, Asthma in the Pul Division of Pulmonary Allergy and Critical Care. And she's also the Senior Director of Clinical Research for my division, Division of Hospital Medicine. And that's a, a re recently new role. And uh, we've been absolutely so lucky to have her as really a mentor and uh, a support for research in our division. And she's been absolutely amazing. Would you uh, may have recalled throughout this year if you've been watching these Grand Rounds regularly, Dr. Nadeau has been with us quite a few times and we've really relied on her advice uh, in a lot of these topics, particularly with vaccines and uh, a lot All of people right. here today. It's being recorded. And uh, we also have uh, Dr. Marshall Burke, uh, we're also happy to uh, welcome today, joining us from the Department of Earth System Science at the University here. He's the Associate Professor at Earth System Science and Senior Fellow at the Freeman Svoboda Institute for International Studies. Uh, he's also the director, the deputy director uh, of the Center of Food Insecurity and the Environment. Um, his research focuses on social and economic impacts of environmental change and measuring and understanding economic development in emerging markets. Uh, Dr. Francois Haddad 
uh, clinical professor in medicine, specializes in the field of cardiovascular imaging, pulmonary hypertension, advanced heart failure transplantation. Uh, he's a director of the Stanford Cardiovascular Institute of uh, Biomarker and Phenotypic Core Laboratory. I'll just add Dr. Haddad, uh, you know, for many years ago, it seems now, but some of my favorite memories as a, a resident was working with you. So, so wonderful to see you again and have you join us today. Uh, Dr. Dr. Mary Prunicki uh, is also with us. She's the director of the Air Pollution and Health Science uh, Health Research at the Sean Parker Research for Allergy and Asthma Research here at Stanford. And her research uh, investigates the impact of things like air pollution, including wildfires, on the immune system in both healthy and asthmatic individuals. She, along with Dr. Nadeau, our, our PI is currently actively recruiting uh, uh, patients, uh, participants, um, to study the wildfires and their impact on health right now. So as you can see, we have a quite diverse group uh, of faculty here that can help us really understand um, what's going on with the wildfires. I will unstop sharing my slides now, and uh, Kari, I'll go ahead and let you start sharing yours, and I will turn it over to you. So thank you, everybody, for joining us today and looking forward to hearing your, uh, uh, what you have to say about these wildfires. Thank you very much, Earl. It's really a pleasure to be here and to be among my colleagues as Team Science to be able to talk to our audience about wildfires, health issues, and adaption and mitigation measures. You can see here in this photo, the people are playing golf nonchalantly while the trees burn behind them. And these two people here are watching this. So I think we need to be uh, careful about these wildfires now. and uh, and we need to do more research and hopefully today you will see some of our uh, cooperation together. What we'll talk about first are some of the causes and what's going on with climate change and wildfires. And I'll talk about some of our team science that then will be relayed by Dr. Burke with epidemiology and economics of wildfires, Dr. Haddad with cardiovascular and our research therein, as well as Dr. Pernicki with pulmonary and some of the lung issues that we're seeing with wildfires. And then I will be following up conclusions and we'll be um, allowing for ample time for questions as well. So wildfires are a global issue. And for those of you watching the news, you'll know that there are Arctic wildfires, wildfires in Kenya, as well as the Brazilian rainforest, including those even in 2017, now even worse in California. In Chile, there were wildfires. And then of course in Australia in December. So oh, hundreds of thousands of acres have been burned through wildfires. And this is really meant to depict the overall issue that we're having here due to climate change and the warming of our planet and the drought conditions that allow for ignition of the wildfires. This was a recent review by the New England Journal this past week, in fact, where you can see that there's a positive feedback loop between greenhouse emissions, climate change, the warming of the planet, the extreme weather conditions, in recent months, we have suffered from the lightning strikes that were occurring in August and some of the subsequent wildfires that we saw here in California. But this is due to the overall picture in environmental changes of ambient air pollution, combustion of diesel exhaust, and climate change. And in the same article, they actually predict if we see what we would anticipate, which would be about a two degree increase in centigrade through our global uh, community, that we will see these increases in wildfire, especially in areas where up to now, we have not seen a lot of wildfires, relatively speaking. So again, this is a growing issue. And I hope those of you interested can read this article that just came out. So this is a depiction of the causes of wildfires. This is courtesy of the California fire in 2017. But you can see that most of the wildfires are man-made. The exception to the rule was the lightning complex that we saw in August. But under the environmental changes of climate, these will get worse. And unfortunately, many of these issues are negligence and through education and through training, we hopefully can prevent these fires. Now, what happens when the fires get out of control, which is what is happening in the wildfire community? People are trying to combat the chemicals that are emitted in the air. And the primary air pollutants are particulate matter, as we all we're very well aware of in our community, PM 2.5 is what we typically talk about, and that's measured in micrograms per meters cubed. And that is 35 PM 2.5 is equivalent to about 100 AQI. But importantly, it's not just about PM 2.5, it's about carbon monoxide, nitrogen dioxide, 
polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, which are six-membered carbon rings that can be highly toxic, volatile organic compounds. But as the chemistry stays in the air, it doesn't dissipate or get better. Unfortunately, it can become more toxic. And so through chemical reactions with the air and with UV light, you can actually create ozone with oxygen and increased winds and sunlight patterns. This is tropospheric ozone, which is different from stratospheric ozone, which actually protects our planet. This ozone that is near the earth is not healthy for our lungs. And unfortunately, masks do not inhibit this particularly. So you see this little girl wearing the mask here. It's not even fitting her, but unfortunately, she is not protected against many of these chemicals. Importantly is that firefighters are one of the most extreme groups that are exposed to these types of chemicals. And the chemicals in wildfires are not just because of wild forests. Dr. Diffenbaugh at the Woods Institute has shown that about 50% of what's burning now during a wildfire is due to commercial and residential homes being on fire. And with that, we see a lot of other toxic chemicals being emitted into the air, plastics, metals, toluene, paint thinners, detergents. And so this is even more toxic. And thanks to the cooperation that we will show you today as examples of our wonderful speakers, I wanted to also give you the hope and promise of the research being done at Stanford through Team Science. I just spoke about Dr. Diffenbaugh at the Woods Institute. We're doing research with the Cardiovascular Institute, Department of Genetics, the Department of Emergency Medicine, the ITI Institute, as well as the Lane Center for the West with health policy and policy changes uh, on political science. And this all focuses around the Department of Medicine today with our division in cardiology, hospital medicine, global health, and QSU. So we're excited to explain some of the facts that we found in our research, as well as what's been found by others. And the School of Earth is also represented in this cooperation. And Dr. Burke will now give his talk on his findings. Thank you, Dr. Burke. Great. Thank you very much. And uh, great to be here. So. Uh, as Kari mentioned, uh, wildfires are, are trending quickly up. If you've been on the West Coast uh, lately, you've felt this viscerally. Here is a plot of the amount of acreage burned uh, over the last uh, near half century. And you can see roughly a doubling of the acreage burned over that period. And as Kari said, we now have very good science that tells us that climate change is really the main underlying dri uh, driver of this. When forests dry out, uh, when they get hot, they are much more likely to burn, and we've seen that uh, throughout the West. Uh, next slide, Kari. Uh, and again, as Kari set up nicely, here's the pedantic version of what Kari said. Uh, wildfires emit a lot of bad stuff. Um, they give us these terrifying looking photos you can see on the left there. Uh, and we have a pretty good sense of what's being emitted from wildfires in total. Um, and that maps very closely onto the burned area that I showed you before. So the more area we burn on average, the more we emit on the right here is a plot of that. And you can see it's pretty linear. Uh, again, the relationship between the, the total amount of forest burned and the emission of key pollutants like uh, PM 2.5. A lot of other things are coming off these fires as well, particularly as we burn uh, into residential areas and, and we incinerate everything under your sink and in your garage. Um, and so you know, studying those other things is, is an important emerging part uh, of this story. Okay, next. Okay, so how do we actually measure these exposures? Um, so the traditional way uh, is done uh, by mainly by the government, by the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, uh, and they use these large, fairly expensive monitors. Here's one on a rooftop, um, and, and these are gravimetric. They basically blow air through a filter and then weigh the things on the filter uh, and then back out basically how much was in the air. This is, again, the gold standard, and these are placed throughout the country and used for official measurement. This is how we monitor attainment under the Clean Air Act. Uh, and these also contribute, of course, to many exposure studies in the, in the health community. So they've been sort of the benchmark for a measurement technology uh, for measuring air pollutants uh, over time. Um, recently, and again, if anyone's living in the Bay Area, I'm sure, uh, like me, you look at these other sources frequently now, um, there are many uh, typically uh, less expensive uh, and sort of citizen science monitors as well. So Purple Air is probably the best distributed one now. They have a great interface where you can see real-time estimates of pollution exposure. 
Uh, these sensors, Purple Air, uh, have some issues, but overall they give a pretty good sense of the spatial pattern of exposure. So here's the exposure last night. Luckily, the last week in the Bay Area has been relatively clear. Anywhere you have green, uh, overall is, is roughly good air. Um, these are increasingly used for science. They're certainly used for doom scrolling uh, during wildfires, um, but also for science. And we actually have some work uh, using these sensors now. Uh, and, and I think they can be really useful for giving a granular sense of the exposure. Okay, Kari, next. Okay, and I wanted to give you, uh, Kari, yeah, uh, a sense of really how widespread uh, the exposure is across the US. So here are fires in 2018, and what you're seeing is smoke plumes as we march forward here. This is satellite based estimates of uh, wildfire exposure. And as you can see in the summer, you get these very large plumes start to blow in from the West Coast down from Canada, our neighbors to the north. Uh, and you get just massive exposures that are not just concentrated in the West Coast, but concentrated across the country. If you remember the campfire here comes in, in the West, just there at the end. So that was a hugely destructive fire um, in California anyway, uh, in 2018. And that was really a blip on the national radar. Uh, some of these other fires generate much, much more smoke that again, covers the country. And so one of my main take homes here is this is not just a West Coast problem. We're getting increasingly continental scale exposure to smoke from these wildfires and understanding the health impacts and economic impacts of those exposures uh, is, is really important and, and is the focus of our work. Okay, so this, we can look at smoke, smoke exposure in different ways. It's becoming much more common. On the left here is the count of smoke days per year. Basically, we use satellites to measure how much is smoke in the air and we can track that uh, for about the last 15 years pretty well. Um, and basically, again, we've seen a doubling of, of uh, on average of the amount of smoke uh, in the air. And this is not just a West Coast story. You can see on the left, this is going up across regions. Each one of those lines is a different region in the, in the US. On the right here is a more granular look. And you can see in parts of California, parts of Arizona, uh, we've seen a, a much more rapid increase. So this is like a tripling uh, or more of the amount of smoke in the air. So we're getting, we're getting exposed to a lot more of this stuff. Um, and you know, and, and it, it's across the country. All right, next. Okay, and it's important to understand that, that actually we had been doing pretty well on air quality. So on the left is the overall picture of PM 2.5. This is PM 2.5 from all sources. And thanks mainly to the Clean Air Act, we have done a very good job of cleaning up our air across the country. We've seen decadal, multi-decadal declines in key pollutants uh, throughout the country. Um, but you can see if you look sort of closely in the last five years that these uh, trends have flattened out and if anything reversed uh, specifically in the West. So we've looked at this and most of this reversal is attributable directly to the growth, the rapid growth in wildfires that I showed you before. So on the right is the predicted percentage of PM from wildfire smoke. And in these really bad years like 2018 and 2020, uh, regions in the West, at least half of the dirty air we're breathing at least in terms of PM 2.5 is coming from wildfires. So, it's really upending, again, this decadal progress we've seen uh, in air quality, and, and that's really bad news. All right, next, thanks. Okay, uh, another thing I, that's very interesting to our group, and I think interesting to other, is thinking about exposure disparities. Uh, so the typical exposure disparity patterns we think about uh, for, for overall air pollution uh, have shown for decades that uh, minority populations, lower income populations, tend to be more exposed to key pollutants. And that's the bottom uh, left panel here. So uh, counties with higher percentage of non-Hispanic white people tend to be uh, less exposed to PM 2.5 overall. The wildfire story is actually a little bit different. We see a reversal in the gradient. So that panel where Kari's cursor is now. Um, so here we see actually more exposure to wildfire among those populations. Now this of course isn't good news necessarily. We don't want anyone exposed to this, but what it means is that uh, this is much more of a shared burden than many uh, other sources of these key pollutants. A everyone is literally being exposed uh, to these fires. Now, this is ambient exposure, so we really need to think about indoor air exposure and how smoke and other pollutants infiltrate indoors. And there again, there could be an important uh, disparity story, and this is one we're actively trying to study uh, with data throughout California. Okay, Kari, last slide for me. Um, so, uh, I'm not a real doctor, as my wife would say, but we use uh, sort of public health data and do more ecologic or epidemiological studies, thinking about how exposure to wildfires affect outcomes uh, as measured in, in this case, 
uh, Medicare data. So we have great data on, of course, where people are. We have longitudinal data and we see their, their health outcomes in many data sets. Uh, and what we can do then is estimate overall what are the relationships between exposure to P2.5 and in this case, the worst outcomes, excess mortality. And so again, this is actually not our study. This is building on someone else who did this in Medicare data. And they find strong relationships between daily exposure to PM2.5 and mortality. This has been shown by others as well. So what we can do is come out with the back of the envelope estimate from the recent fires, combine this known dose response function with the increase in PM2.5 that we saw and estimate how many excess deaths likely occurred in California over the last uh, six weeks. And we saw excess uh, PM of about 100 to 200 micrograms on some days, which is a massive increase. That was from the fires. And you combine that with the dose response function and we get uh, estimates of 1,000 to 3,000 excess deaths in California just for the older adult population, 65 plus in California alone. Now, again, this is a prediction. This is not a measurement, uh, but this back of the envelope suggests this is a major, major uh, health problem. So I'll stop there. Thanks, Gary. Thank you so much, Dr. Burke. The next speaker will talk about some of the ideologies of those unfortunate uh, mortality uh, extrapolations, and that's Dr. Haddad. He'll be talking about cardiovascular and some of our team science research. Dr. Haddad, go ahead and uh, yes, take you. it away. Thank you. No, thank you, thank you, Carrie. I'm I'm really happy to be to be here and and discuss the the work we've done in air pollution. So I just wanted to mention on this area of air pollution, there's a big interest to look at air pollution and cardiovascular health. I want to point out some excellent review that has been done on the topic. One of our faculty, uh, Brian Kim, actually is focusing on exposure and environmental health and cardiovascular health. He's going to be, I think, a leader in cardiovascular division on the topic. I want to talk, there's a big interest in, in the presentation. I want to talk about two aspects. One aspect is going to be the epidemiology of cardiovascular disease and pollution. And the other one is discuss a study we've done with the lead of Carrie Nadeau and Mary Puninki of the Fresno air pollution uh, study. So the first part on this slide is just the same slide, same picture that really highlights the pollution around the world. And that's really global variation in pollution. We see that there's pollution that, pre that presents uh, in certain countries like Canada or Australia. Uh, previously, Australia didn't have a lot of pollution, but for the wildfire, the pollution in Australia has increased. In some countries has really an excess in pollution exposure notably Africa, India, Bangladesh has really an, an excess in pollution exposure. Cardiovascular health is also a global problem. And on the other map on the right, you could see really cardiovascular disease. And although we cannot create a relationship, the, the prevalence of pollution that is present in the world and cardiovascular health has led people to consider pollution as one of the risk factors in cardiovascular health. Bob Harrington said that there's a statement paper coming out from the major societies the HE, the ACC, the European societies about pollution or more specifically air quality and cardiovascular health that will come out in the recent months. Next slide, please, Gary. We like to see evidence in cardiovascular health. In this great review in The Lancet in 2018, they divided the degree of evidence in cardiovascular health in three zones of evidence. What is the evidence that we have that that pollution is related to, to all-cause mortality, cardiovascular mortality, and there was a zone one evidence that there was well-characterized adverse cardiovascular effects that were well-established. In terms of zone two, the emerging evidence, and that remain, remains unquantified, but are being quantified in recent years, is the effects on hypertension, diabetes, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke, and heart failure. In zone three, that even more work is being done right now and being quantified is really the effects that there is happening in thromboembolic disease, atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. Next slide. People have done again in that landmark uh, study and review in the Lancet in 2018, they tried to quantify the hazard ratio related uh, with pollution exposure. People have focused a lot on PM 2.5 in their studies and we could first see in this graph, first, the different standard that exists around the world. The standards in India, in the EU, the US, and the WHO standard differ. And people are becoming more strict in their standard about air pollution as the evidence is accumulating on the adverse effect on the cardiovascular health. And as we see, there's really a nonlinear relationship, but the effects really increase as we're increasing in PM concentrations. Next slide. 
I'm going to focus in the next few slides really on team science and with the momentum of, of Gary, Joe Wu, Bob Harrington, and a lot of people in the division. And there was a study, Fresno Air Study, that Gary and Mary led for close to 10 years now. Uh, Fresno is an area in, in the valley in California where there's a lot of exposure and the pollu average pollution or median air quality pollution is actually very high. So this is a study actually uh, that, that Mary came and asked ask really opinion on this study where they were studying teenagers and adolescents to really see if we could see signature of air pollution even in adolescents that live in the Fresno area. The first aspect we want to focus on is this is a study of 100 teenagers in the Fresno area and we measured by the, uh, the, like Marshall was mentioning, the different components of air pollution the PM 2.5, the ozone, the PAH, the CO, the NO, the NO2, and the PM, PM, PM 10. The first aspect we want to know that even though we focus on PM 2.5, it's really an interrelationship within different pollutants. And different areas of the world may have different influence and interactions between pollutants uh, that is present in a specific area. When we want to translate this research, we often use biomarkers to translate this research. And this is a beautiful graph by, by Eugene Brownwald, really a pioneer in cardiovascular research. And this is the star of biomarkers that really relates some different axes of biomarker research. One looking at myocardial stretch, oxidative stress, neurohormonal activation, renal dysfunction, inflammation, matrix remodeling, or myocardial injury. Two other axes that are really important in pollution is hemostasis. And the other one that's getting much more attention is DNA methylation, where Stanford is a pioneer in. And the aspects that we'll discuss, the axis in pollution that are very activated is the axis of oxidative stress, the axis of inflammation, the axis of hemostasis, and the axis of cellular profiles. These are the aspects we'll discuss in the following slides. So the first message here is really that we will highlight the message of the oxidative stress and hemostasis in pollution exposure. This is the same study from Fresno and 100 adolescents in, in Fresno. And I just want to mention the work that was done by Nicola Koperna. He's, he's, he's a PhD, uh, PhD visiting scholar at the Cardiovascular Institute that works also in Leuven Institute. I want to mention uh, Yael, uh, Yael at the HIMC, which really is, is amazing to work with. And she leads a lot of the experiments of biomarkers at the HIMC and Holden Maker that really has been a pioneer and without him, these studies would not be possible. So we looked at immunoassays, and in immunoassays, a lot of these biomarkers, like in a lot of biomarker studies, we have high dimensional data sets where we have a lot of biomarkers that we assay in small population. In this study, we looked at, at 80 biomarkers and 100 teenagers. And a lot of these biomarkers are related to each other, and we could not look at them with classical statistics. So people use methods like partial least square methods, which look at these interrelationships between biomarker and assess the importance of biomarker with different, different metrics. And here's the VIP, which, which is the variable importance of project, on projection that looks at the importance of biomarker. I just want to point out for the PM 2.5, even in teenagers, some of very high signals, usually we consider 1.4, 1.5 as significant in the PLS very high signals we find in both MPO and GDF-15. GDF-15 is a marker of, of oxidative stress, among other things, but it's also one of the, the most important biomarker of aging, and it's actually the strongest biomarker of it, circulating biomarker of aging. So teenagers had really high levels of GDF-15 as well as MPO. We also know that, that monocytes were really present. When we look at the other component that was less related to PM2.5, the PAH, what well, we could notice interestingly as is markers of hemostasis, the ADMSTS that relates to von Willebrand factor, and also, also D dimers were also elevated and related to, to the PAH levels. And the other pathway that we saw was the inflammasome pathway with elevations in interleukin 18 that was also present with PAH. Next slide, please. So this is excellent work from, from Hisam Mobasak working in Karina Doe's lab, where he used mass cytometry in the same population to look at the representative sample of teenagers that had high PM 2.5 versus lower PM 2.5. And he only points out that really an abundance of the monocyte population that we could see in these teenagers. And the monocyte seems to be a key cell that 
seem to be related with the pollution of ketone share. We also find it in the, in the, when we stratify patients on the MPO level. One of the key questions, I'm moving to work of Brian Kim. He's a new faculty in the division that wrote that white paper with Karina Do and Jaha. That one of the key questions that we have when we talk about pollution is we see pollution in the environment where we measure, measure the environmental level to PM 2.5. But one of the key questions is what is the individual and personalized exposure of a person? Because people may live indoors, they may have filters in their house, and they may not be exposed to the same ambient uh, air pollution level. So one of the pathways of pollutions and both endogenous and, and for pollution related is the, is the aryl hydrocarbon receptor activation pathway. And this is a pathway that's conserved in the evolution and that seems to increase when people are exposed to pollution. At this time, it's unclear whether increased exposure or activation of the aerial hydrocarbon receptor pathway may be detrimental when overactivated, but it's actually a hypothesis of research. In this study, in a representative sample, we looked at the teenagers that had high systolic blood pressures and diastolic blood pressure based on the recent AHA guideline. What we saw is that the CD14 cells with high AHR activation, really the patients with hypertension really had higher AHR activation, which points to the higher personalized pollution exposure. And these patients, the inflammasome pathway and the AHR pathway and the modicine was actually, actually more activated also. Next slide, please. When we're trying to look at the personalized cell, a lot of the work of, of Joe Wu uh, this is the work of Gen Jennifer Archer Atham that really uh, was, a, was a postdoc in Holden Maker's lab and now is a postdoc in, 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 in Jonas Herkakis lab. And she really works on endothelial function and, and environmental exposure as well as genomics. And one of the tests that she did, she took the samples from these uh, teenagers that had high PM 2.5 and exposed them to aortic endothelial cells and to cardiac aortic cells. And she saw that in, in, in the teenagers or adolescents that have high PM 2.5 in their blood, in their exposure, sorry, their blood actually was really impairing tube formation in endothelial cells and also NO production in these cells, as we could see in the bar graphs and the violin plots on the, on the right. It was, we also saw a signal with the interleukin 18 and in that, that teenager that had high interleukin 18 really had also high uh, impairment in tube formation. We didn't see a that strong sig signature for the interleukin-1 beta uh, in this teenager study. So, so in summary, I think from, from these, uh, from, there's a clear signal that pollution impairs cardiovascular health. There's a statement paper that's coming out from the multiple cardiovascular societies. And in this team science cardiovascular health study, we're showing that pollutants really activate oxidative stress, inflammation, and hemostasis. And we could find really different markers of individualized pollution exposure, and really individualized effects in patients on endothelial cells. So thank you, Carrie, for- uh, thank, you. thank you, Dr. Haddad. I'll now introduce Dr. Pernicki, who is part of our research cooperative team science group for studying pulmonary effects with wildfires and PM 2.5 and air pollution. Thank you, Dr. Pernicki. Thank you, thank you for having me. So now we're switching to the respiratory system. And um, as you can see on the left, uh, we see a smoke plume, which consists primarily of PM 2.5. And these smoke plumes are more likely to stay aloft and travel distances as we've been talking about. Um, in comparison, towards the bottom, larger pieces of ash uh, will tend to settle to the ground faster and will not travel as far. <clears throat> when, uh, any type of particulate or size of pollution is inhaled, the size determines how far it will go down into the respiratory tract. So for example, PM10, which is larger, will only go partway down the respiratory tract, but smaller particles like PM2.5 um, and ultrafine particles will go all the way down to the base of the respiratory tract um, and uh, will be able to cross over into the circulation at the level of the alveolus. Next slide, please. So here we can see black dots, which depict the particulate matter um, that has reached the level of the alveolus. Uh, the alveolar barrier is very thin, 
on the order of 200 to 500 nanometers. And it's here where the PM2.5 or smaller particles cross into the circulation. While many macrophages will try to uh, engulf the particulate matter, um, we know that wildfire particulate matter is thought to be four times more toxic to the macrophages than particulate matter that's been um, derived from non-wildfire sources. In addition, other cells such as the dendritic cell and the bronchial epithelial cell shown here will try to get rid of the uh, pollution. Um, this cascade will also mobilize inflammatory cells from the bone marrow into the circulation, cause production of acute phase reactions from the liver and increase circulating uh, 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 inflammatory uh, cytokines. Uh, finally, it's important to men mention that gases such as the VOCs and nitrogen dioxide can also cross here at the level of the alveolus and cross into circulation. Next slide, please. So when we look at the wildfire and health literature, the most consistent finding is that there's an increased risk of asthma-related events after wildfire smoke exposure. And this has been demonstrated across the globe. There's also increases in other types of respiratory outcomes, including ER visits and hospitalizations for COPD, respiratory infections, uh, uh, physician visits, and associated medication use. There was a study by Delfino that looked at the impact of the 2003 Southern California wildfires and found that an increase of 70 micrograms per cubic meter of PM2.5 during a heavy smoke uh, outbreak was associated with a 34% increase in asthma admissions. And this effect was strongest for those age 65 and older. In addition, they found that an increase in just 10 microns per cubic meter of PM2.5 was associated with a 7% increase in ER visits and hospital admissions for COPD. Next slide, please. So there was another study that investigated the, the 2008 Northern California wildfires um, in which there were thousands of wildfires ignited by a lightning storm over a weekend. And the exposure, smoke exposure in the fires lasted for approximately six weeks. Um, during this time, uh, the PM2.5 level was at least 100 micrograms per cubic meter, which corresponds to an AQI rating of, of unhealthy. So what they found was that there's a linear increase in asthma ER visits and hospitalizations for every five uh, microgram per cubic meter increase in PM2.5 from the wildfires. They also found, interestingly, that women were likely to seek care for asthma uh, 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 exacerbations, um, looking at both ER visits and hospitalizations than men. Next slide. So we thought it was important to talk a little bit about masks. Um, on the right, you can see an N95 mask, which filters out 95% of the particles as small as 0.3 microns. Um, a 95 mask can be fit tested, um, but they only filter out particles. They do not filter out gases. Um, in contrast, when we talk about a surgical mask, the purpose is different. It's to protect others from the aerosol expelled by the person wearing it, and those cannot be fit tested. And so when we look at different ways for um, pollutants to be inhaled, there's basically two pathways that that might occur. One is through leakage through the seal, and the other is coming through the filter medium itself. And as you can see on the graph on the right, um, most, uh, uh, leak, most penetration from the pollutants comes from a leaky seal. Um, the, uh, the surgical mask um, has, starts out with a much less um, effective seal and as you can uh, tell, um, both the type of mask and the seal itself is extremely important when we talk about mask wear. Next slide. So this moves into some research from our lab. Um, and we wanted to focus on the, um, um, uh, the uh, health effects of prescribed burning, such as 
because it's such an important wildfire management tool. Um, what we did is we retrospectively analyzed blood samples collected from six to eight year old children living in Fresno, California. Uh, they were selected if they had their blood drawn um, up to three months prior to either a prescribed burn um, happening in Yosemite or a wildfire happening in Yosemite. And we chose two fires that were approximately the same size and the same duration. Um, these fires were occurring about 70 miles from, from the kids in Fresno. Um, when we then selected, we ended up with 32 uh, children who had been exposed to a prescribed burn and 36 children uh, who had been exposed to a wildfire. The 18 control subjects came from the Bay Area. Um, and when we analyzed the blood and looked at the different uh, immune cells, we found that in comparison to the prescribed and control groups, the wildfire group had a diminished population of Th1 cells. In addition, we looked at methylation patterns um, in the immune genes, and we found that the wildfire group had increased FOXP3 methylation in comparison to the other two groups. And FOXP3 is a transcription factor for T regulatory cells. And this result was consistent with the other findings we've seen just from uh, regular air pollution studies. We also saw some trends uh, with clinical symptoms. Um, those in the wildfire group had increased wheezing and asthma exacerbations. And there was just a trend um, for a difference in pulse pressure in the wildfire group as compared to the other groups. This next study, uh, we looked at um, a group of teenagers exposed to a wildfire versus controls. Uh, these kids were 16 years old. We had 25% or 25 subjects who were exposed to the wildfire and 42 controls. And we uh, 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 looked at the plasma and the HAMC, performed a luminex pan uh, panel um, on their plasma. And what we found is that there were increases in both CRP and IL-1 beta in the teenagers exposed to the wildfire. And again, the uh, fires that were occurring were about 70 miles away in Yosemite um, uh, and uh, you know, not in the near vicinity of these kids. The reason, uh, okay, and then uh, our ongoing research studies include looking at um, uh, exposure here in the Bay Area. So last fall, when there were no wildfires, we collected baseline data uh, on campus. Uh, we collected questionnaires and blood. And then during these most recent fires, we resampled these individuals. While we're still analyzing the biomarker data, here we're presenting some of the questionnaire data. And what we found that during the wildfires, uh, most recently there were um, significant differences uh, in uh, symptoms of burning eyes and throat, fatigue, um, headache was elevated but not significant, and we didn't see changes in voice. Um, while we don't know what pollutants cause this, uh, these findings, we do know that um, some gases such as VOCs, formaldehyde, and others can cause some of these symptoms, and those are uh, typically components of wildfire smoke. In addition, we questioned them about mask wear. Uh, we saw that during the current wildfires, more people wore masks, which is good. Um, when we looked at the type of masks they were wearing, the majority were wearing uh, ordinary uh, hospital or dust mask or cloth mask, um, a small percentage wearing N95 masks. Um, but one curious thing is of these uh, participants, 10 people had access to an N95 mask, but chose to wear an ordinary hospital uh, type mask. Um, and so that leads uh, to um, some questions on whether or not, you know, more education is needed regarding the effectiveness of masks during wildfires and that they're not, we're not talking about the same uh, uh, criteria for um, protecting ourselves with COVID. Next slide. So in addition, we're very um, excited to be going to be doing a, a firefighter studies with Mark Petro. Uh, who is the, um, uh, out of the emergency department at Stanford University. Um, 
we are evaluating both acute and chronic smoke impacts, looking at active firefighter cohorts, in which we're interested in comparing um, the impact of uh, structure fires, wildfires, and prescribed burns pre and post exposure. And we're also interested in looking at the long-term chronic exposure in a retired firefighter cohort. Um, the reason we feel this is so important is there is certainly a lack of data um, on the impact of smoke especially on uh, uh, occupations such as firefighters that are exposed to it uh, so much. And we know that these uh, firefighters uh, have an increased um, uh, mortality rate related to cancer. Um, up to 60% of uh, firefighters um, have um, deaths associated with the cancer. And so we're really excited to be performing these studies and to learn more about the uh, impacts of smoke. Thank you, Kari. Thank you, Dr. Pernicki. That was excellent. And I will conclude briefly with a summary. And um, I hope that we have shown you some of the incredible research going on around the world, as well as in our own uh, university with cooperative work across different schools here. But importantly is that there is not a lot of data on wildfire and wildfire research. So we hope this is also a catalyst to many of you listening about some of the questions that still uh, exist to be able to try to answer through research and cooperative work and interdisciplinary work. We've shown you about the chemical makeup of wildfires and toxicity levels. We've explained about PM 2.5 and respiratory and cardiovascular effects in specific. We're trying to understand better about the chronic and acute issues going on with wildfires. We also wanted to point out throughout the talk that there are vulnerable populations at risk, and especially those at the edge of forests, those people that are underserved and cannot have access to disaster relief programs or to the uh, costly uh, filtration and uh, masks that are needed to be able to best protect against the health effects of wildfires. There's going to be an increase in wildfires in the future. We need to learn how to mitigate and adapt to them. The need to prevent is critical and interdisciplinary research is very important. The paper in the New England Journal that I had mentioned previously I think also helps us because it puts personal actions into a stratification from most effective to least effective. And it's sad to say the most effective and the um, easiest to do is to relocate, relatively speaking. And unfortunately, that's not feasible for many people. Uh, closing doors, using HEPA filters, and we're happy to answer these questions during the question and answer period about filters in the home as well as in specific rooms. But that can be cost prohibitive for many people that are uh, under served and don't have access to healthcare as well as they don't have necessarily the, the monies to be able to pay for these types of filters. Staying indoors is definitely something that we suggested for all of our patients during the wildfire issues here in the last six weeks, but importantly is depending on your house, you can have a leaky house, weatherization is very important. We're, we're working with Linda Clever and other groups to be able to improve weatherization of homes as well for climate change as well as for filtration. Finally, wearing a mask. Many of you will likely have questions about this. We're happy to try to answer what we do know. However, it's hard to do randomized clinical trials with masks or no masks. We know, thanks to Dr. Pernicki and others, that N95s are the best, but those are costly and they're not suitable for children and the cost may be prohibitive. So what can we do about wildfires? We can, number one, mitigate. We can slow down and stop the warming of the atmosphere by stabilizing greenhouse gas emissions. We can learn how to adapt and build defenses and prepare for the consequences of climate change and prepare for wildfire reduction through prescribed burns and other uh, mechanisms. And importantly, let's talk to patients, talk to the public, talk to government officials, and learn how to manage and provide clinical care prospectively and proactively for our patients uh, and talk to them about the issues around wildfires and perform more research together here at Stanford. So I wanna thank everyone. We do need to tackle climate change and we are very happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Nadeau. And really, thank you to all the doctors um, for this really great topic uh, and presentation. Um, as you see, there's a lot of questions popping up right now. And I'm just going to jump into them and try to get through as many as possible. Um, you know, the, one of the top questions Dr. Singh asked, uh, no surprise about HEPA filters. Uh, is there any data on HEPA filters or other types of indoor filtering to reduce risk? I also want to tie in Dr. Vasquez's question as well. 
can you comment on the effectiveness of commonly available indoor purifiers? I just want to say, when I had our, uh, our child come last week, um, probably an, an overly anxious parent, but I have a, an indoor sensor and I have filters in the house. I, I was surprised to learn how bad the indoor air quality is when the outdoor air quality is. There's very little, the, the, the circulation, it gets pretty bad in here, but the pure air purifiers, when I turn them on, the AQI would literally go down to, to zero almost. Um, do you guys recommend uh, filters? I'm just curious, do you also have them in your own houses? Yes, thank you. Uh, let me uh, go to one slide. Uh, this was given to us by our colleague, uh, Benjamin Horn in Utah, who's done a lot of work, thankfully, on filtering indoor air. And I'll, I'll show some of his data uh, because this question is key. And uh, Dr. Pernicki is doing a lot of work on filters and what, if people are interested, and I'm sure many of you might have gone on to Amazon and bought filters for your homes, but MERV stands for Minimum Efficiency Reporting Value. And so this is part of the scoring system to use for HEPA filters. And you can see here, usually a score of about an eight is helpful, but as you move forward and increase the score of the MERV, that allows you to know that that filter is going to filter out very small particles. So like uh, Errol was mentioning, if you can get these filters into your air duct system, and this is assuming a, a well weatherized home, that you can reduce the um, exposures to small particles. But to uh, the question about studies, there haven't been a lot of them. So we have a dearth of data to be able to help us understand what's the best way to manage. However, common sense would say, you can place a filter in that filters out small particles please use it in your homes. We need to create more of these clean air locations for people that don't necessarily have access to filtration or air conditioning. And I hope that that is a focus of our communities and our local governments. But importantly, you can see again from Dr. Horan's study that there is a reduction, a trend for reduction. This is a small study that he did um, through the work in Utah. But importantly, as we don't have enough data yet, Dr. Pernicki is actually doing more studies like this in Fresno. Thank you. Thank you. Um, curious to the other presenters as well. Do you guys also, um, do, do you recommend, uh, I think everybody, it sounds like probably everybody recommends if you can have access to, to have a filtration system in your house, probably I'm guessing would be the universal recommendation. I see uh, Dr. Birch nodding head. Dr. Ab absolutely. We had the same experience with indoor monitoring as you. I, I thought our house was pretty well sealed and we got a purple air monitor indoors. It was like, oh God, uh, we need, <laughs> And I went on Amazon and spent, you know, $700. Yeah, when the AQI was um, 165 outdoors, it was 165 indoors. It was really quite concerning. <laughs> Dr. Pernicki? Yeah. Yes, um, so my experience is we have uh, indoor air monitors and I have one in my daughter's room. I can tell when she uses hairspray. I'll be downstairs and I just watch the numbers go up. Um, and uh, we live in a newer home. So I thought, you know, we, we were pretty good with uh, filtration. But during the past month, um, even though we had everything sealed up and we were running the AC continually, it smelled like um, a barbecue inside sometimes. So uh, we're, we're watching the sales um, to decide <laughs> which uh, air filter, uh, air purifier deal we can get um, because you have to look at the size of the room and match the size of the purifier with the room. Um, so we're trying to decide which bedrooms we target um, or how to handle that um, because it's just not possible um, you know, to purify the entire home as well as you would like, um, and at least for us. Great. And before I move on, Dr. Dodd, any comments as well? No, I also purchased a few air filters for, for the apartment, and it's also helped. I, I know my daughter had some allergies, and it, it also helped her significantly. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, I'll move on to the next question that Dr. Barkin asked. Can you separate out excess deaths caused by smoke due to COVID-19? I can take that one. Yeah, that's very hard. So our, our data are what happens to all-cause mortality uh, in non-COVID years when you're exposed to wildfires. Uh, and actually, inference for wildfires in a population health setting is, is pretty nice in the sense that the wildfires are pretty random. I showed you the plumes before, and so we can compare people randomly exposed to people not randomly exposed. So in a non-COVID year, we have a pretty good sense. Um, in a COVID year, uh, we don't yet, uh, that we're actively studying that. I know Kari and Mary and, and group are as well. Uh, there's two stories that are told. One story is that people are actually uh, less exposed because they're inside uh, due to COVID or staying at home. And so potentially exposure to wildfire smoke has gone down. 
Alternatively, the other story and some emerging evidence suggests that exposure to air pollution worsens either susceptibility to COVID or outcomes conditional on being exposed. Um, I think the science is not resolved on this yet, and, and so we need a lot more work. Yeah, sure. A um, couple of questions here, uh, the most voted up right now, uh, Dr. Nichols, and another question here about, uh, and you touched on this a little bit, the oncogenicity of smoke from wildfires and secondary to residential fires in comparison to tobacco. Dr. Nichols asked, are there any studies that suggest the rise of lung cancer among lifetime smokers is attributed in part to these wildfires? And perhaps, uh, uh, Dr. Kornicki, I know you commented a little bit on this. Yeah, um, so I am not aware of, I mean, we know that um, smoke exposure, we know in the PM 2.5 literature for air pollution, that PM 2.5 exposure is associated with lung cancer. Um, so it, it stands to reason that um, there are, there will be increases uh, in lung cancer from these enormous exposures to PM 2.5 from the wildfires. I am not aware of studies um, showing that, however. Okay, um, and just one other part of this question as well, uh, the economic and class-related risks uh, and availability to, to indoor work and, and whatnot. Dr. Burke, you commented a little bit economics. I think Dr. Mandel, you also commented a little bit on this. Any additional thoughts? Go ahead, Kai. Or I can. Uh, yeah, the, I think better understanding the infiltration points that were just made. Um, it's, can we, um, so, so at least in terms of ambient exposure, we see less disparity for wildfires than we do for other types of exposure. We really care about indoor exposure if people spend 80 to 90% of their time indoors. And so if lower income communities or individuals are less able to make the investments to shield themselves from this exposure, we anticipate that this will exacerbate the inequality. That's something we're trying uh, very hard to quantify uh, right now, but that's that's our hypothesis. Yeah, I, th I agree. I think we've seen that already. We're dealing with the Fresno communities for which the one third of the community is below the poverty line and the average salary there is about 30,000 a year compared to the Bay Area and the access to the Bay Area exposed communities with wildfire to the same extent in Fresno is hugely different. The disaster relief programs, the ability to unfortunately evacuate and have access to filtration, to masks. It's a world of difference. So we need to make sure we help those underserved and those that are high risk and, um, and think about proactively how to anticipate those issues. Great. Um, Errol, and maybe a small comment is even when we do the, there was a comment in the questions, but even when we do these mechanistic studies, for example, in the Fresno area, it's very important to account for socioeconomical status because people that may live closer to highways, which people know have higher exposure, are also have a different sometimes economical status uh, depending on the region. So that's important to account for that because that could be a confounder in a lot of the analysis also. That's why the assays like the, the aryl hydrocarbon also could look at personalized but doesn't take into account the confounder of socioeconomical status also. Uh, Dr. Harrington had a uh, question, comment? Yeah, Francois, I want to follow up on the, uh, the biomarker work that you were presenting. Uh, most of what you're presenting is blood biomarkers. Do you have other markers, uh, imaging of atherosclerotic plaque, um, flow studies to understand endothelial function, to try to give us a sense mechanistically of what, what actually is happening in uh, people who have an increased risk of ischemic heart disease? Is it progression of atherosclerosis? Is it instability of atherosclerosis and plaque rupture? W what do we know? I think there's a two data. I think the intimal thickness in some study was increased with exposure to pollution. But what's very difficult, I think, is the multifactorial nature. And, and there's been a few studies that really have accounted for pollution, personalized pollution exposure, plus the usual standard risk factors that we know about atherosclerosis. I think these studies are, are needed to be done in depth by accounting with all these, all these factors that are present. Uh, one of the initiatives that Mary's uh, proposing right now, there's a study they're gonna do in the firefighters in the region to really trying to establish to see how much early cardiovascular disease they have and taking into account the exposure history that they know. So you were talking about other biomarkers, I think other biomarkers that are, we should we should use more to, to study exposure is really calcium score. 
which is an affordable biomarker that is also present routinely. Intimal carotid thickness would be interesting, but not as cost, cost, cost effective. I think other biomarkers, methylation pathways that will be important to look at in cardiovascular disease that haven't been looked at as much in detail. And inflammation markers for inflammation of the heart is interesting with PET studies, but still really uh, limited to the realm of, of, of focused research. What about endothelial flow and uh, relaxation? They're interesting. The problem with flow-mediated dilatation, there's been a lot of variability with the different assay and the different laboratories, and they always have to be standardized very early morning without coffee and with, with really a good night's sleep. So these have not been always done reproducibly. The PPG equivalent for flow-mediated changes have been looked at more, more, more recently, and I think there'll be more interesting data for indirect flow mediation and a tail function that could be seen. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, David Sachs asks, are central uh, HVAC HEPA system, systems more effective than room portable HEPA units? I don't know if you have an answer to that question. Um, I, think, I think it probably depends on the units and, and the size and all the variables that might be. Dr. Nadeau, any, I know you're smiling there. Any, any comments on this? And Dr. Pernicki, feel free to chime in. We just don't <laughs> yeah. have the data yet, but go ahead, Dr. Pernicki. Yeah, my understanding that the flow rate is extremely important and that the house um, units aren't able to have the flow rate that a, that a portable air purifier can have. And so that the portable air purifiers per square footage are more effective um, because they can generate a higher flow rate. Gotcha. Um, I, I, yes. Errol, may I ask a question to the panelists? Do, do we have information on the air quality of the hospital? when people work at the hospital. No, just by our university in general, do we monitor that indoors? Just as or indoor environment at the university or the hospital? I've taken an air sensor into it before. It's very good. Very good. <laughs> uh, but yeah, let's think we don't, I imagine it's a uh, pretty good quality all the time, even during the fires. Um, one question here, how much could the fires be prevented by controlled burns? This is a good question. Yeah, Dr. Burke, maybe, or? Sure. Yeah, the, uh, controlled burns uh, are, are our main tool for, uh, other than mitigating climate change, which is maybe a harder problem. Uh, they're our best local tool for mitigating uh, wildfire risk. Um, in California, I think the Newsom administration uh, is on board with this now, and they're proposing controlled burns of a million uh, acres per year in California, if that if that's funded, that's great. We probably have 20 or 30 times that that need controlled burns, given the century legacy of wildfire suppression. We've been putting wildfires out instead of letting them burn as they did historically. And so we have so much uh, built up fuel that this is a really, really hard problem. But so the, the, the risk is not going to be eliminated by controlled burns. But uh, if we do these at scale, and it's going to cost a lot of money, we can, I think, substantially reduce the risk uh, over time. I'd just like to add that this past summer with uh, the uh, COVID pandemic, control, some controlled burns were put on hold. Um, and so I think it's really important that we get this um, figured out, um, you know, at to what scale we should do prescribed burns, regardless of our, our um, you know, situation with, with COVID or any other type of viral outbreak. That's a good point, Dr. Pinnicki. We continue to hear the indirect effects of COVID. That's a, a great um, thing to point out. Um, I'll just go for maybe a minute, two more. Sorry, I went a little bit over uh, as, as topics like this are so uh, interesting and important. Um, if it's okay, we can answer a few more, maybe two more questions. Uh, thanks for sticking um, after nine o'clock. Uh, one question here, um, without air conditioners, it gets hot inside and we need to open windows. Uh, do we leave HEPA filters on? Is this useful or ridiculous? Any thoughts on that? Dr. Nikki? I would say, uh, well, ridiculous. I mean, you have to, it, it has to be geared to uh, the uh, square footage that that filtration can handle. And, um, you know, if you open up windows, you're not going to be able, the air filter purifier is not going to be able to keep up uh, with the filtration. But it is a problem, especially with the elderly and the heat. Um, it's, it's a huge, it's a huge problem and a trade off. You know, do you, do you breathe that air or do you, you know, potentially have some type of con consequence from the heat? 
I think this is one of the awful compound risks of climate change. We should expect the co-occurrence of these things more and more in the future. We saw them this year. We're going to get coincident heat waves and wildfire exposure more and more. So this is a this is a real question that we need to figure out how to deal with. Another question I want to get to, just some practical ones for asking it. Riding in your car, do automobile uh, uh, filters, the typical ones, not without most cars don't have HEPA filters, reduce the, the PM 2.5. I've, I've actually tested it a little bit and seen it comes down a little bit, but nothing on HEPA filters. Is that roughly what you guys see? That's um, Yes, I don't know data on actually um, filtration in the car bringing it down, but I, there was a study that showed if you're in the car, if you put it on recirculate, you do decrease overall your uh, continued exposure to the pollutants on the road or um, out in the environment. So I always keep windows up and uh, recirculate on. Great, thank you. Um, that's great practical advice. I'll end on this question here with Dr. Uh, Wang, Christy Wang. Uh, do firefighters have an increased risk of consequence of poor air quality? Dr. Kinecki, toward the end, you commented on this. It sounds like there's not a lot of studies on it, but there are ongoing studies. Any uh, additional thoughts on that? Um, well, you know, there, yeah, there aren't a lot of studies and, you know, we don't even have a, an, a, a good idea of how much cumulative exposure these wild, uh, these firefighters have been exposed to. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to start thinking about should we be monitoring their lifetime exposure to, to smoke in addition to trying to figure out how it impacts the body. Um, my only other comment is uh, anecdotally when uh, we've been talking to the firefighters, they say that if there's a, a fatality with the firefighters, it typically happens in the um, cleanup phase. Um, and um, anecdotally, that's when they take off their mask and, but you still have all the toxic embers uh, and you're still breathing, even though the fire's out, a lot, of, a lot of those toxins. And so we're super interested in looking at the different phases of fire cleanup um, and you know, uh, what, what is going on um, biologically during that time. Dr. Pernicki, you mentioned earlier, I think it was 60% of firefighters have cancer-related deaths. Um, Dr. Winslow sent a, a message earlier. He, uh, he asked us to do, send a shout out to Cal Fire and the California National Guard. I think this year has been quite a, quite a taxing year for first responders and I uh, thought we'd maybe end on just acknowledging all the work that, that they do for us. So um, a special thank you. I don't know if there's anybody listening or family members, but a special thank you for those people helping take care of us. Um, yes, thank you. Thank, thank you guys for this uh, really insightful, amazing Grand Rounds. And um, really uh, kicking off uh, our first Grand Rounds, and it, mostly non, non-COVID team, although if there are lots of connections as always. Um, thank you so much. There are a lot of questions, a lot of practical questions. Um, if it's okay, I'm going to send a follow-up email with these questions. If there's any yes. questions, but we're going to email it out to everybody along with this uh, video um, to get those questions answered. And, and again, thank you for your time. Thank you for being with us. And thank you. Thank you for everybody who stuck with us as well. Hope you have a great week and stay safe. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you for being here. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.